Good, good evening, everybody. Good to see you all tonight. Um, so good to be with you all. Glad to have the opportunity to share God's word with you. And want to say hello to those of you that are tuning in online as well. Welcome to Hope for Our Times. Um, let me just uh, go before the Lord in prayer before we open his word. Father, thank you for being our God and loving us the way you do and sharing so much about yourself that um, whenever we want to get to know you better, all we have to do is open your word and let you speak into our lives. And so speak to us now, Father, would your spirit give us wisdom and understanding and show us how to apply what we learned tonight to our lives. We pray this together in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, um, really excited to share some of these things I get to share with you tonight. Um, a lot of what I've, I'm going to be sharing has been a long time in the making, so um, it's one of these things that, that God allowed me to be a part of. I'm actually quite amazed that I got to be a part of it, um, so excited to share that with you, but before we do, let me just say what I, I love to, to tell people is um, if you are a disciple of Jesus, that means two things. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. I want to remind you to win your friends and win your family and win your neighbors for Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you are just joining us today uh, and you're new to this whole Christian thing, uh, maybe you're tuning in online, somebody asked you to watch this message because it is so pertinent to the culture that we're living in, uh, welcome online. And I just want you to know something that God accepts you exactly how you are. I want you to know that he accepts you just as you are and he sees a great massive amount of potential in who you can be. And what I mean when I say that is you do not have to fix yourself to come to Jesus. You really don't. And if you're trying to do that, I hear people say it all the time, I'm going to get right with the Lord, then I'll get back to church, or I'm going to fix my life up and then I'll give my, my life over to Jesus. Really, you're just wasting your time because you're never going to be able to do it on your own. The beauty in Christianity is we give ourselves over to a holy God that loves us so much, and He will come into your life and He will work on you from the inside out. And it's a really incredible thing. And He knows that once He gets into you, he can do so many wonderful things. So he does see a massive amount of potential in you. I'm so glad you're here with us tonight. You may have seen one of these before and referred to it as a Bible. For those of us that are disciples of Jesus Christ, this is much more than a Bible. This is the inerrant and the infallible word of the one true living God. Those are two fancy theological words. All they mean is everything is in here is right. It is correct. It is perfect. It does not contradict itself. It has never changed. It's the same yesterday as it is tonight as we go through it. God willing, we wake up tomorrow. It's going to be the same. Heaven and earth are going to pass away. Word of God will endure forever. I challenge all of you to prove me wrong in what I just said. Now, that being said, because we do hold the Word of God in such high esteem, we are going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you want to make your way there, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And the title of tonight's message is, Perilous times have begun. Yes, they have. Well, I'm glad I've got some people in agreement with me tonight. Hopefully, many of you online agree as well. Perilous times have begun. Now, last time I was with you, we talked about the idea that the delusion has begun. The, the God said that He was going to send a delusion upon people because they've rejected the truth for so long that, that there's going to be this supernatural work. This is what he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. says uh, that for this reason, because they've rejected the truth for so long, God's going to send a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Now we tried last time to answer this question, has God begun that work of sending that strong delusion? Uh, if you missed last time, go ahead and check it out. But I believe God has begun that work. And now we haven't seen the completion or really the, the totality of what that's going to look like. We know there's going to come a point in time when God will rapture the church. We're going to be out of here and um, it's going to be an incredible thing for us, but it's going to be a really sad thing for the people that are left behind because they have rejected God on so many levels. They don't want anything to do with him. And they've, we, we took it all the way back to Genesis, to the very beginning and all that he created. They've rejected him on every level, and they're going to reject him even in the midst of the rapture. We're going to be gone, out of here, and they're still not going to believe. And there's going to be this supernatural work of delusion. In other words, 
everything that, that they should see and should understand and should believe, they're not going to believe it because of this supernatural work within them. And so if you did miss it, you can just go to hopeforourtimes.com, catch up, see what's going on. Um, but tonight, whether or not God has already begun that work, I believe he has, um, one thing is for sure, Jesus is coming back. That's for sure. I have zero doubt in my mind. I know that unequivocally Jesus is coming back. Now, how do we know that? How do I know that? Um, and how can you know that? Well, it's very simple. He told us. It's very simple. I mean, he has given us so many signs to be looking for. So many signs. I mean, some earthquakes, right? Earth how many of you heard, heard about this or felt this one? I mean, 7.1 right here in California. And what the, the experts are saying is that we are expecting thousands of aftershocks from just this one. And there was uh, a 6.9 over in Indonesia just this morning or last night. Um, just incredible amounts of earthquakes going on everywhere, even in the oddest of places. And so we know that this is one of the things God said, be looking for. So even months after what we felt here in the last week, we're still expecting more. And that's weird to me when you have an earthquake and then you have an aftershock that's bigger than the original. But we're having some weird stuff go on all over the world. God said to anticipate it, look for it. When it happens, know that we are closing in on that time. Well, I've got this earthquake app on my phone. It was going off like crazy. I finally, you know, you can like adjust how many levels, like how, like how on the Richter scale, how high you want the alerts. My family finally said, would you just increase that? Because this is ridiculous. I mean, there's something like 3,400 aftershocks from this one. And it's incredible. And hundreds of them, 4.0 and higher, which is incredible. So that's going on right now. Of course, God said that there would be lawlessness, Right that lawlessness would abound, that the love of many would grow cold. Well, um, there's an article in The Independent just a few days ago in the, in the United Kingdom, and Sir Mark Rowley told BBC Radio, he said um, that there was a need to call for the government's flagship policing reform to be scrapped as uh, part of measures to stop a feeling of lawlessness. They're feeling a feeling of lawlessness there in the UK. I'm feeling a feeling of lawlessness right here in America. Um, this is going on all over the place. And according to this article, he said that this system they have of 43 regional police forces uh, governed by elected politicians was, quote, not the way to structure policing when we're dealing with global changes like cybercrime, online child abuse, and terrorism. So there's this feeling of lawlessness. God said when we close in on the end times, lawlessness would abound. I would submit to you tonight that we're seeing lawlessness abound, not just here in Riverside County, not just in California or America, but we're seeing lawlessness worldwide. This is of epidemic proportions. Not only that, we're told that there's going to be a third temple that would be built. And just recently, uh, Trump's ambassador to Israel, um, the question was, did he call for the third temple to be built in 2019? Because we passed this um, time of celebrating the 4th of July. So on July 3rd, we were told that the U.S. Embassy in Israel preemptively celebrated America's 243rd Independence Day just this last Tuesday. And at the gala event, uh, as it was hosted by the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, during his speech, the ambassador, David Friedman, said, this year in Jerusalem. Now that, many people are saying, is very telling. This year in Jerusalem. The article goes on to say that at first glance, saying a phrase like, this year in Jerusalem, may seem rather insignificant uh, as a statement, but those who understand the wider context of the phrase are prone to interpret those words differently. That's because there's a phrase that Jews proclaim during their prayers at the end of Yom Kippur and during the Passover feast that, that goes like this, next year in rebuilt Jerusalem. So he's saying this year. And so many people are saying, is this telling that, that Trump's ambassador to Israel is calling for that third temple to be built right now in 2019? Now, 
we don't know, uh, but there are hundreds of other signs that, of Jesus' return. Hundreds of them. And I want to talk to you about one of them in particular tonight, and that is the sign of perilous times. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says that you and I should know this. Know that in the last days, perilous times will come. And I want to pull out that word for just a moment, this word perilous. Because perilous times, when you're in a perilous time, the idea of a perilous time is that you are exposed to imminent risk of disaster or ruin. Now, any students of history? None of you, not many of you are nerds like me. Okay, Th- those of you that are nerds like me that like history, I love history. It's awesome. It's literally, I mean, it's my favorite subject because the Bible is jam-packed full of it. And you can't really understand prophecy if you don't understand history. And one of the things that you will find as you study history, you see the rise and the fall of many great empires. Study the book of Daniel, we know you see you know, the rise of the Babylonians, and then they fall. And then you see the rise of the Medo-Persians and the fall. And then you put the rise of the Greeks, and then you fall. And then the rise of the Romans, and then they kind of fell. We're still kind of seeing what's going on there, right? But as you study the fall of all of these great empires, any nation that has fallen, any great civilization that fell, there was something very particular about it. There was a rise in something that started to be accepted, and that was sexual immorality. Not just sexual immorality, but the forcing of adult sexual immorality on children. That was typical of the fall of a nation. Why? Because there is an end to God's patience. God is extremely long-suffering. He's not willing that any would perish, but there is an end to His patience. And I believe, because I've studied the fall of many of these nations, I believe that when God sees that people's sexual perversion is now being forced upon the children, and the children are being affected because of this, God's had enough. You look at perilous times, it means you are in imminent threat of disaster, imminent threat of ruin. And you look at all the big, powerful civilizations right now on this planet, you're seeing the sexual perversion of adults being forced on children. And we are one step away from the disaster that God has told us will be coming. This great day of the Lord. One of the things we see in this as far as adults' sexual perversion being forced on children is a huge rise in the abortion of children. Worldometers, have you ever been to Worldometers, the website? Worldometers, there's these, these things that you can look at and they're actually like, tacking on like seeing how things are going so it's like a like a tachometer just counting up right um as you look at that if you look on the number of abortions being performed in the world the the number when i took this screenshot which was just last night was 21 million 756 thousand murdered unborn children this year alone in the world that is more than one per second. You can literally sit there and watch this thing count up. It's like, like watching, you see the national debt, right? You've seen that one where it's just like going like crazy. You watch this and literally you're seeing this thing just tick away. And as you're, as you're watching this tick away, it will dawn on you that you are literally watching the murder of unborn children just one at a time. And it's faster than the second hand. This is adults having sex, trying to think they're having sex without consequence. But what they're doing is just forcing their sexual perversion to have it affect these unborn children. God won't allow that to continue. It's not in His nature to let that continue. Almost 22 million. That just breaks my heart to know that these poor unborn children are being affected because of the sexual immorality across the world. Of course, child child trafficking is on the rise. It's literally child trafficking for sex purposes is the largest, fastest growing criminal industry in the world. It's, It's going by leaps and bounds. Why? Because there's a market for it. It's that simple. There are men and women, but mostly men all around the world that are all too willing to pay for that. 
but with children. It's unreal. And so what will it be like? What will people be like in these perilous times? God says that in the last time, peril, in these last days, perilous times will come. Take a look at this verse again. Perilous times will come. This is how people will be. They're going to be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. This is just horrible to think about. They're having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. People that are living like this, we are commanded in God's Scriptures, turn away from them. It's weird because as you look around the church, there's a, when I say the church, I'm talking about the universal church. You look at churches all across America in particular. One of the things you see is this very quick willingness to bring people like that into church. See, they've forgotten that church, when you bring people into church, we don't bring people to church to get them saved. I mean, of course, that can happen at church. Of course, people give their life during church all the time. It's awesome. But that's not why we bring them here. It's not why we gather together in church congregations. Why do we gather together? For the equipping of the saints. For the work of the ministry. Right? We, we come together, we get equipped, we go out. We go do the work of the ministry. Now again, it's cool to bring people to church and they get saved here, but you all can do that on your own. You don't need Pastor Tom, you don't need Pastor Tim, you don't need Pat. You don't need us to do that. You have everything you need to help lead somebody to Christ. That can happen on the soccer field, it can happen at the gas pump, it can happen at the register, at the store. This can happen at your next door neighbors for coffee. It can happen anywhere. And it should be happening in all those places. I mean, it's a beautiful thing that God has given each and every one of us the ability to share His Word and bring people into a relationship with Him. Beautiful. That's what we do, right? I mean, that's the working of the ministry. But there's this huge push to say, just bring everybody in. Bring everybody in and let them just live however they want. No, God said, no, these people that are living like this, turn away from them. Don't be hanging out with them because that's not a right way to live. Now, as I, as I listen to these things, certain words really stuck out with me. Unthankful, ungodly, unholy, um, disobedient. When I hear these words, I think about why I was ever not those things. Why was I ever, why was ever the opposite? Why was I ever thankful? Why was I ever loving, right? You think about that. Why were any of us good people on earth, right? I mean, we're not, there's nobody that's good, but to, to the worldly standards, how do we become good people? Well, our parents raise us up, right? Parents train their kids how to be thankful. This isn't a natural thing. Babies aren't born selfless. Babies are completely selfish, Right? Think about it. I mean, children, two-year-olds, they don't know how to be kind and loving. They have to be taught those things. You take a two-year-old and you put that two-year-old in my body and give that two-year-old a hammer, that two-year-old will kill you for taking its toy. It will. It does not know better. It needs to be taught how to love, how to share, how to be thankful, how to be loving, how to be kind. All of these things that's listed out here, these are things that are taught by parents to their children. They're raised up to know these things. What God said here is that when we get to these perilous times, the way people are going to be acting is as though their parents have not been involved in their lives. Do you see that? And here's what I'm telling you. There is a huge, massive, massive effort to cut parents out of their children's lives. And it's happening all over the world. And I hate that that's going on. I really do. And some part of me doesn't want to actually believe that. 
Some part of me wants to believe, no, you know what? We live in America. This is the land of the free, the home of the brave. No, 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 no. That's, you know, in America, you can raise up your kids. You can train them up to know the Lord. We bring them to church. We go to baseball games. This is America. And yet, I'm telling you, one of the things God has opened my eyes to is this systematic effort to cut parents out. It really is, and this is where I was telling you, I've got something I want to share with you guys tonight. Maybe some of you have seen uh, a video that I've put out, um, but I'm going to share portions of that video. If you've already seen it, I'm just going to share portions. If you haven't seen it, um, these portions are going to blow your mind, uh, but I highly recommend you go see the, it's a 31-minute documentary that, that we put out with Jeremiah Films. But God opened the door for us to be at a Riverside County Office of Education meeting where your tax dollars are being used to pay for a company to train up school districts how to cut parents out. And it's a company that they pay, it's called Cardia Services. Now, anybody ever heard the term Cardia? Okay, I'm not, I'm not the only one that did not have a clue what Cardia was. Okay, good. So when I first heard it, I'm trying to like make a connection, like Cardia. So cardio, like is this like your word with your heart? So I started looking that up, but that's not how it's spelled. It's spelled differently. So my wife's actually the one that, that found this as we're sitting there going through. She said, hey, take a look at this article. So I'm looking at this article, and I see this ancient Roman goddess associated with the hinged Roman doors. I thought, okay, well, what's that? Hinged Roman doors, that, that's weird, you know. So I started digging into this a little bit more because it was the exact same thing, Cardia. So looking at this further, what we found out is that this particular set of divinities was associated with marking out sacred spaces and fixing boundaries. And I'm telling you, as you hear the things that they're teaching the school districts to do, literally what they're doing is they are fixing a boundary. They are setting out schools as a sacred place for them. They fix the boundary and they want you, the parent, or you, the grandparent, they want you out. And that might just, you might hear that and be like, oh, come on. And I'm telling you this, this is not just in California. This is all over the United States. And this has already happened in the UK. This is already happening up in Canada. This is worldwide. But it's happening right here where we live, and if you're watching online and you live in America, it's happening all over America. And literally, this company called Cardia Services, they, they get our tax money to the, in Riverside County just in one, one year to the tune of tens of thousands of dollars of our money to train them to cut us out. You might be thinking, no, come on, this is just far-fetched, this is just too much. Well, I'm going to share just a couple of clips with you so we can talk through this, but I want us to understand that we are living in these perilous times. We truly are. And these perilous times are happening because parents have disengaged, whether they've done it of their own free will or there's outside forces trying to cut them out. Parents aren't engaged in their children's life, at least not the way they should be. Not the way my parents were engaged in mine. It doesn't seem to be getting any better, but let me just go ahead and and share some of this with you. Here's the video. Yeah, because there's a lot. They're going to talk about opt-in, opt-out today. So, um, uh, not, yeah, that, and also um, uh, the rights of students for leaving the campus to have some medical um, attention. Concerning certain pregnancies, so, but I think it's other things, too. Because I don't know the rules, too. That's all new to me. My name is Mike Wari, I'm the Executive Director of Instructional Services, which of course is a health-focused uh, area, so we come to falls under instructional services. Um, we've been very fortunate to um, uh, partner with uh, Kira Services. They have a grant to provide these kinds of networks throughout, Cal throughout California. It's all about the ed code and the fact, so we realize there's some uh, uh, perspectives, um, but it is, uh, the ed code is pretty clear that it's about the facts and not about something. And so they try to do that. Um, there's some, today I think there's going to be some law that's going to be talked about, so that'll be clear, and they'll be very, they tend to be always very clear on the law. Again, my name is Adriana Rodriguez. Um, this is Luke Dotson. Um, I'm the director of our San Bernardino office. Always in the area and available to chat. Um, okay, so I guess let's get started.
So they're right there, what you're seeing, and I'm sorry, I just lost my spot here. I'm going to you catch this up. Um, it's all about the You know, office, they can walk in the um, I think I think a good way to think about all of these is these are just services that California Sorry, you guys. Today, I think there's going to be some law that's going to be talked about. So that um, because they're just that important and students really need to be able to access them. And, you know, they're very sensitive in terms of a lot of times students don't want to talk to their parents or guardians about these kinds of issues. But it's those who can't, right, who are in dangerous situations, who are going to have their college tuition taken away, who are maybe experiencing abuse at home, right, that, can't, that need to have that barrier cleared for them. Yeah, somebody caught that barrier. So a member, a former member of Cardia Services, actually, after we put this video out, they called us up. They were so excited to see that somebody had exposed what they were doing because as they were working for Cardia Services, they said it became so clear that the parents were not referred to as parents. They were referred to as the barriers. We're, we're the barriers that have to be removed. I mean, here's the idea with a barrier. A barrier is there to make sure you don't fall into something dangerous, Right. I mean, so if you're going to call me a barrier in that sense, go ahead all day long. I'm a barrier to make sure my kids don't get into a dangerous area. Barriers are important, but what their whole idea is, we as the parents are the barrier that needs to be removed because the children are in a dangerous situation like their college tuition is going to be taken away. If, did you hear that? Their college tuition, this is dangerous that their college tuition might be taken away. I mean, God forbid the child end up in a, University system that, you know, think about what's going on in these university systems. They're being indoctrinated into all sorts of wickedness. But they're saying, listen, we don't want these kids to be in dangerous situations, so let's get the barriers removed. That's how they view us as parents. We are the barrier to them being able to get these medical services. That they should be able to leave the campus without the parents knowing, so that way they can go and get abortions, they can go get, and, and if you notice, it said at any age, any age, any age, they can go get abortions. They can go get transgender therapy. They, so if it's an eight-year-old girl and says, I want to be a boy, but my mom and dad said I can't be a boy, the eight-year-old can leave campus, go and get testosterone put into her, then go back to campus and the school's not allowed to tell the parents. This is California state law, and this is not just in California. It's all over the nation. These types of laws are creeping in. But it's not just that. Let me share some more with you real quick. Young people have the right to leave school to seek confidential medical services without the consent or notification of their parent or guardians. And, and I think the key thing to remember here is that when you're thinking about confidential medical release, the right belongs to the young person. So it doesn't belong to the parent, it doesn't belong to the school. The right lies with the young person. The most important piece of this is that schools cannot share this information with parents or guardians. Um, also, no parent calls. So, you, so it's, you know, a teacher or the attendance office can't call home and say, so and so is out at, you know, the doctor's office receiving X. Um, did you know about this? You cannot do that. You cannot do that. You know, if your child's out getting whatever, X, whatever they're getting, no call home to the parents. And notice the, the language there, the young person. Young person, young person. If, if the right, you're wondering who the right goes to, the right goes to the young person. Child. That's what we're talking about here. A child. A child who has no right to go and enter into a legal agreement to buy a car on their own. We, we're there to help them for that, but we can't be involved in making decisions like whether or not they're going to kill the child inside them. No, they, that's because they're a young person. They can make those decisions on their own. This is how they're, they're going about this kind of stuff. They are completely, 100% cutting the parents out. Some districts do things like they'll say, oh, the student was with an administrator at this time, and that administrator, you know, they won't answer further questions. It's a little tricky, though, which is why it's kind of more of an art than a science, and there are a few different ways to do it, right? It can't say the student was in class just like every other day, right? Because that's not true to the law for like reimbursement reasons, um, which is why we think kind of the best option is something that is like amorphous, 
doesn't disclose that that person was off campus having a medical appointment. Mm -hmm. But saying it's an excused absence does not like directly violate the law. So here's what you want to do. This is their training. This is Riverside County. They're training the school districts. Okay, here's what you have to do. Because do you notice there's a reimbursement that we have to get? You all know this. So the federal government gives money to the school districts for each child that's there. Every day the child's there, the school gets a certain amount of federal money. Well, if the child is not there, they don't get the federal money. But we still want that money, right? So let's make sure we mark them down. And just, you know, some school districts, here's what they're doing. They just say the child was with an administrator. They just lie child was with an administrator and that way if anybody calls the administrator the administrator won't say anything else no that's the we'll, this is what we'll do we'll just lie and it's really more of an art than a science did you catch that they're they're teaching them the art of stealing our tax money and the art of deception something that would mark the, the end times deception and i cannot tell you how many parents I have talked to about this subject right here? And you know what they tell me? Oh, no, that's not happening in my school district. Is your school district in Riverside County? Is it in California? Guarantee you it's happening in your school district. They're just not allowed to tell you. Because they'll get sued. They'll lose their job. This is what's going on. This is real stuff. And instruction has to teach students about gender, gender expression, gender identity, and exploring the harm of gender, negative gender stereotypes. It is not only um, bias-free, but it is affirmatively inclusive of those folks and relationships. Schools may not facilitate a selective opt-out just of the queer stuff, just of the LGBTQ stuff um, in sexual health education. We've heard a lot of parents, unfortunately, who say, um, I really want my kid to learn sex ed. It's important. However, none of the gay stuff. They can't do that. So schools may not facilitate the selective opt-out of lessons that are focused on LGBTQ content by parents or guardians whose students are otherwise in the classroom for other sex ed instruction. Practically, it should be impossible. Because the idea with Chaya is that LGBTQ people and relationships are interwoven into the entire curriculum, right? It's not like on day three you learn about queer people and everything else is straight people. That's not how it works, right? Um, and so opting out just of the LGBTQ stuff is illegal and should be also impossible. It's illegal and should be impossible. And she says, you know, we've had some parents, unfortunately, that say they don't want their kids to learn about this stuff. But they can't do that. That's what they're saying. They can't do that. You as parents, you as grandparents, you, that you have, have your children and grandchildren you're raising up, no, you can't do that. And notice it said, there's a word in there that's really important for us to, to know what they're saying. It says that these issues, the LGBT issues, have to be discussed in the affirmative. What does that mean? That means you're not allowed to speak against it. It means your son, your daughter, your grandchild, Going into the classroom as a Christian cannot raise their hand and say, no, 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 there's not an infinite amount of genders. God said male and female, he created them. They're not allowed to do that because that's not speaking about these other, these issues in the affirmative. So what are they doing? They are compelling students and compelling faculty to say that these things are good. That's what that's going, when they say, they speak about these things in the affirmative. Are we living in the last times or what? I mean, this is incredible to me that these are the things that are going on. And I think that was, yeah, that was the, it, the end of the video here. Um, so that's what is going on. It is incredible to me. Now, this is just a portion of what we got. And the 31 minute long video, that's just a portion. I mean, we've got so much footage. It's incredible. And I, it was so weird. Like we didn't, asked to go to these meetings like god just opened the door we had no clue what we were getting into god wanted this stuff to be exposed and god made a way for these things to be exposed but god told us that in the end days that this is how people were going to act they're going to act unloving 
unforgiving, unholy, unthankful. I know this for a fact. Those are the characteristics that take place when people don't have their parents involved. You've seen it when you're going through Walmart, right? And you see that kid, and the kid's just throwing a fit, and the mom or the dad's just looking at him like, oh, well, you know, they're just throwing their fit. My wife hates it when I see that, because I just, I'm like, time for a spank, ain't it? <laughs> like, whack that kid. I, when, I, when my kid acted like that, man, he got, he got the, the boot, I'm telling you. And guess what? My kid doesn't act like that. Now he's a grown man in seminary. Because I treated him the way he needed to be treated to grow up right. I was involved in his life. He is thankful. He is holy. He is loving. He is kind. He, he is those things that he should be as a young man because his parents were involved. His grandparents were involved. But we are quickly living in a time where Satan is finding his way around to make sure that parents aren't able to involve themselves in their children's lives. Not just at school. So I'm not just picking at school. And, I'll, and let me just give this little qualification here. Not all people that work at the schools are bad. There's a lot of great Christian teachers, great Christian administrators. There are. Their hands are tied in many ways. And I'm just waiting for the day when they all just get together and rise up and say enough is enough. You know? But they're in, a, they're in a time right now where they know if they say anything, their job is gone. I've talked, to, I've talked to teachers. They're like a year or two away from retiring. And they're like, you know, Pastor Tim, because I'm asking them, I go, you're a Christian. Why don't you stand up to this stuff? And they're like, Pastor Tim, I'm one year away from retirement. I'm going to lose my entire job. You know, and this is where, where they're at. But it's not just in the schools. This is all over the place. We have been cultivated to be busy, to have our mind focused on things that it shouldn't be focused on. This stuff that's just vanity, it's a waste. And I talk to parents all the time, they're like, yeah, you know, we got to get more involved in our kid's life. We're just so busy though. You know, we've got this and we've got that. Get rid of that stuff. Unbusy yourself. Spend time with your children. Read the Bible to them. Pray with them. Spank them. Do whatever you have to do to show them how they're supposed to act as a believer in God. Train them up in the way they're supposed to go. That way they won't depart from it when they get older. But we live in a day and age. God said these times would come. I, I'm going to just suggest that we're there. We are. We're there. We are, we are in that time where perilous times, they've come. Perilous meaning we are in imminent danger of disaster, of falling apart. We are. Now, that's not a doom and gloom type of thing. For me, that's exciting because God said that this is exactly how it would be. If God told us this 2,000 years ago, that this is how it was going to be. So to me, that's exciting. As, as bad as this stuff is, I'm excited that we're living in those times where we know Jesus is coming back soon. If you are here today and you heard this message and you're like, this is my first time at church. Somebody just brought me out. They said, you got to hear this, this message. You might be like totally overwhelmed, but understand this. These verses that I've read to you tonight, or maybe you're watching online, look these up for yourself. These verses were written 2,000 years ago. And they haven't changed. Not one bit. They have not changed. Year after year after year, it's remained the same. God told us to look for these things, and we're living in the time that they're happening. Incredible. What a blessing that we know that we could walk outside and Jesus could return just walking outside. This is incredible to me. And so be excited. Don't be discouraged. If anything, what this should do is encourage you, get out and share your faith more. Get out and share it more. And I'll tell you, one of the things I've found is that there are a bunch of people that are just thirsty for truth. They can't wait to hear the truth. And it's really cool, you know, my son found himself at this place where there was a bunch of tattoo artists. And these tattoo artists, they asked my son, they go, what, what do you do? He goes, I work, I work at a church. And they go, oh, what church? He said, 412 Church in Marietta. They go, I saw a video about that church. He goes, let me guess, the sex ed video? And they're like, yes. And they were, they were it was cool for my son. He said they, he knew they had watched it in its entirety because they started talking about all these details that were woven in through the entire thing. And you know what he said they, they said? 
these people that, that are atheists, he said they, they read the comments. People had said, oh, that's just religious people. They're just religious. Which, okay, I am. I'm a religious person. Okay, big deal. Get over it. But they were, they were saying that because we're religious, then you know, that we should be discredited. And you know what they said? They said, no, this isn't just religious. No, there, that's, there's something wrong with that. And they knew. They knew that this, this, this was wrong. This stuff should not be taught to children. Because it doesn't take a person to have a big, fancy degree to, to, degree to know that this stuff is not appropriate for children. It's just not. Letting a child leave campus to go and get an abortion, that's not appropriate. Letting an eight-year-old girl, I keep saying eight because there's, there's doctors that are just pushing testosterone into eight-year-old girls. Letting an eight-year-old leave campus to go and get testosterone injections without their parents knowing, there's something wrong with that. This is not, this is not holy. This is not right. This is not lovely. You know? And so this is the times that we're living in. And we all need to be aware one of the things that I notice over and over and over again in God's Word, God says to watch. This is what we're watching. We're watching these things happen in front of our very eyes. Parents need to watch. We need to be aware of what's happening. And I'll tell you, we need to be involved. We need to love our children enough to say no when they need to hear no. We need to love them enough to tell them the truth as much as they don't like the truth. We need to love them. And so... Exciting times. This is, this is incredible stuff. And it's happening right in our backyard. It's happening all over our nation. And so let's pray tonight as we hear these things. Let's just pray that God would give us strength to stand. Stand against these things that are taking place. Stand in the, the gap for these children who so desperately need somebody to protect them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us the ability to open up your word and to know what you've said. From 2,000 years ago, Lord, you told us about these things. You told us to open our eyes and watch. You told us to read your word and know the signs and the seasons. And Father, we see the signs. We see them all around us, Lord. We know that the time is near. And so we pray for your soon return, Lord. We pray that we would be found busy. That we would be busy doing your work, Father. That we would find ourselves praying that prayer that your Son Jesus taught us to pray. That your will would be done in our lives just as it's being done in heaven. That when you come down, Father, that you see us doing what you've called us to do. Sharing your word. Being the salt. Being the light. Lord, forgive us for those times where we haven't, want, we haven't wanted to be those things. We're afraid of being the salt because the salt stings. And we want to be liked by people. Lord, you tell us that if we love mother or father more than we love you, we're not worthy of you. And so, Father, help us to love you more than we love anybody else. Help us to love you so much that it causes us to not care what the world thinks of us. Help us to love you enough where it drives us to be that salt, to preserve our communities, to be that light that, yes, attracts people to you, but also exposes the wickedness that's in the darkness. Lord, we, the church, we've forgotten those things. Because they're not popular in our culture, Lord, but help us to be unpopular. Help give us the boldness, Father. Give us the strength. Give us the courage to be exactly what you've called us to be, nothing less. And Father, if there's anybody here tonight or anybody that's watching online and they've heard these things and they don't know you, they don't know you as Lord. They don't know you as Savior, but they've heard these things and there's something stirring inside them. They don't even know how to describe it, but Father, the rest of us who have entered into relationship with you, we know exactly what's stirring in them. And we know exactly the struggle that the enemy is trying to impose upon them to not say yes to you. I pray, Father, that they would give their hearts and lives over to you, that they would answer that call that you have on their life. 
And so if there's anybody here right now and you need to get right with the Lord. You came in here with one way of living and you know you need to walk out with an entirely different way. And you know that you can't do it on your own. You know you need Jesus in you. Would you just raise your hand so that way we can pray with you today? Just raising your hand saying, I accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. And I want to live right for Him. I want to have life everlasting. If that's you tonight, just say this prayer in your heart after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I have not lived the way you've called me to live. In fact, I've fallen far short of that. But in this moment, I know that I need to have change take place. Would you send your spirit to live within me? Would you cause me to be born again? To have a new life in your son, Jesus. Be my Lord, be my Savior. And give me all the strength, courage, wisdom, love, patience, self-control. Father, give me all that I need to live the way you've called me to live. And I promise each and every day when I wake up that I will do my best to live in a way that brings glory and honor to you. And I pray this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. If